So I want to study now, uh, we, we, uh, we have seen uh, the, the properties of these electric uh, uh, and uh, uh, magnetic fields, uh, that they have energy, they carry momentum, right? Uh, so you understand uh, that uh, they, they have a physical reality. Now let's uh, write the general solution of the Maxwell equation, right? We have studied particular solutions up to now. In particular, we have studied those solutions that were not time dependent, but now uh, it's, the, it's the moment uh, uh, that we want to solve the, uh, the full set of Maxwell equations by using these green function techniques, clearly. Uh, so, but uh, uh, it, it, as it turns out, it's easier, I mean, it's more or less the same, but uh, traditionally this is done uh, by using the potentials, okay? So let's start from the potentials. You remember that these equations uh, allows us to, to, to write, uh, uh, because it's the divergence, uh, the vanishing of a divergence means that this B field can always be written as the curve of another field that uh, we already know and that we call the, uh, the, the, the vector potential, right? Now, if you, you see, then, uh, uh, okay, this is always true because this is always true. I mean, this is true no matter uh, whether the, 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 the field is, is changing time or not. On the other hand, uh, you remember that uh, the scalar potential was introduced by, by, by exploiting the fact that the curl of E was vanishing, right? Because the curl of a vector vanishing means that this vector is a gradient. But now you see that uh, 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 this is no longer true because of the because of the of the Maxwell equations. Uh, it's not any longer true that the curl of E vanishes. In fact, the curl of E is e equal to the partial derivative of, of B, right? But if you if you put for B this result that is always true. Uh, you get the, the next best thing because you see it's not true that the curl of E vanishes, but it looks like the curl of, of E plus dA dt, that vanishes always, okay? Because you replace B by the curl of A, then uh, you switch around this uh, time derivative and the curl, ho hoping that uh, there are no singularity around uh, making that uh, uh, ill-defined, and therefore uh, it's not true any longer that the curl of E vanishes, but the curl of this combination of E plus the, the, the time derivative of the vector potential uh, uh, does vanish. And therefore, is this quantity, is this quantity that uh, uh, is, uh, is, the cur is the gradient of, of a scalar? Let's put the minus as we did uh, before, okay? So you see that now, if you study the scalar and the, and the, um, and the vector potential, to get E is not enough to, to, to take the gradient of the potential, but you have this extra, this extra term here, so e, you need both. You need the scalar as well as the vector potential to obtain uh, to obtain E. Okay, so it's not as simple as it was in electrostatics, but really it's not that much more complicated, right? And uh, you see, to do this, we 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 use two two of the Maxwell equations. So we still have the other two. And the other one is this famous Gauss law, right, that, that the divergence of E is equal to the charge. But E for us is this, right? E for us is this. So I get the gradient of this minus, uh, uh, sorry, the divergence of this minus the gradient minus the time derivative of the vector potential. These things is equal to this uh, rho over epsilon naught in the, in the international system of units. So that is the other 
uh, where we, we can now, if you take the divergence of the gradient, so let, let's, uh, let's do this, uh, right, uh, is, is, the, is the Laplacian, so is, this is the first term. And the second term, uh, again, we can switch around, so it's minus d dt, the divergence of a. So this is equal, and uh, this is the, so this is what uh, the Gauss law gives us uh, when applied to the potential, to the potentials instead of E. How about the other? You see now one, two, three of the Maxwell equations. What uh, about the last? Uh, the last one was this C square curl of B to go back to the uh, minus DE DT, right? This combination was one over epsilon zero J going back to this uh, international unit, <coughs> okay? And again, I have to replace B and E by, by, uh, by this. So B, by this and this, to, to write the, the, I want to write the Maxwell equations in, term, in terms of the uh, vector and scalar potential. So let's do that. So this is C square, the curve, of the curl of A, right? Minus the time derivative of E, and E is that stuff over there. So minus gradient of phi minus dA dt. So what is this? Uh, uh, so this is the usual, is the, is the curl of the curl so I can never remember this, is, is the gradient of the divergence minus the Laplacian, I hope. So this, this, this left-hand side altogether is, is, uh, is this. So I have a C square, right? So I have minus C square. Let's write the Laplacian that I like here, right? This is minus, then plus uh, this term here. So plus C square, the gradient of the divergence of A, plus, you see, minus minus become a plus, so plus dt, gradient of phi, plus, now here you have the derivative twice, so plus uh, the second derivative of the vector potential res with respect to, to and all this is equal to this j. So this is the other equation. And it looks complicated. Okay. So I have to solve, so if I solve these two equations, then I've solved the Maxwell equations, right? But you see, they are complicated, and the main reason why they are complicated is not as much because of this Laplacian and all stuff, but because they are coupled. You see, to solve the one for phi, I have to know A, and vice versa, to, to solve the one for A, I have to know. And from our experience with differential equations, if they are coupled, uh, it's complicated. So let's see what we can do. now. We go back to an uh, idea that I introduced earlier that is this thing with the gauge invariance. That tells you that if you change your vector potential A from A to A prime defined by this, so you introduce a scalar function, I call it psi, okay? By, by this shift. So this is a, a transformation, right? I transform my vector and scalar potentials according to this rule. Fro I go from A and phi to A prime, phi prime, and this, this psi is just a, an arbitrary scalar function, okay? Now this transformation is called a gauge transformation, and what uh, 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 we already discussed is that if you do this in the potential, you get the same E and the same D field, right? Why? Because you get exactly the same uh, uh, Maxwell equations, right? 
In other words, if you do this gauge transformation, remember, remember that E is uh, and B is equal to this, right? Now, I don't remember if we did this homework or not, that uh, if I do this transformation, I plug in here, I get the same E and the same B. Did we or did not we not? No, then this is, is for you. So uh, is, is that clear? You, 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 you take, you, 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 you replace here the primes, right? You plug in these, I mean, it's a one line to prove it, and you get exactly the same E and B, okay? So that's why it's called gauge invariance, because I can shift, reshuffle these fields by this transformation, and I get the same E and B. And since I do not measure the potentials, but I measure the fields through the Lorentz force, I get the same physics. So this is an invariance of, of the world. It's an invariance of the equations uh, uh, described in the world. OK? And if you don't believe me, just check. And then on Monday, we check together. But let's take this for, for, to, for true. Then you see that uh, this allows us to, uh, we can always change e, the, the vector potential and the scalar potential in such a way that uh, this equation is satisfied. Meaning that you start with an A and the phi that do not satisfy this equation. You can shift by introducing this scalar function in such a way that this, at the end of the day, this equation is indeed uh, satisfied. Do you see that? It's just a matter of picking the correct psi. So this is another homework. I mean, there are, there are micro homeworks. It's not that you are. Now you have to spend the weekend. It's, just, it's like five minutes. So again, you plug in the, the shifted, and you will see that if psi, if psi uh, satisfy this equation, that is the same, almost. Well, if psi satisfies an equation, uh, otherwise there is no homework, if I write that. Uh, if psi satisfies a certain equation that you are going to verify, then uh, this is always satisfied. So you can always find the gauge that is this function in such a way that this, uh, the new A and phi field satisfy that, okay? That's the, the idea of the gauge invariance. You reshuffle your potentials in such a way that some additional condition is satisfied, okay? But now you see that uh, if this is true, hmm, you see that now here you can replace, because it now in this gauge that is called the Lorentz, somebody, ah. The homework is, uh, okay, this is, is this. And this one is to find what condition your psi function must satisfy, must satisfy in order for this to be true, okay? And since psi is arbitrary, you can always find the psi that's, that allows you to fix the gauge in this way. If your A and phi, if your vector potential and scalar potential satisfy this equation, this gauge that is particular is called the Lorentz gauge because this is the gauge that Lorentz decide to work in in order to simplify this to Maxwell equation. But you see that if, this, if, if the divergence of A is equal to this, then this equation become, uh, becomes, uh, uh, right, uh, 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 this is minus 1 over C squared. Oh, D2 phi. T square equal rho over epsilon zero, right? 
because in this Lorentz, the divergence of A is just the partial derivative with respect to T of phi. Then you get another partial derivative with respect to T, so you get the second partial derivative of phi with respect to T. And actually, the same happened here, right? Because you see that uh, if this is true, then you can replace um, uh, in here. You see, you get the divergence of A is equal to this term. That term combined with that to cancel, and then you are left with only this, right? So you see, it's a very clever choice of gauge. Right? This becomes minus 1 over C squared, divergence of phi dt, right? The C squared cancels. You have a minus here, a plus here, so this cancels with this. And you see, you are, you are left with exactly the same equation for each of the components of, of your vector fields. equal to, uh, not, uh, not rho, but this mu uh, I think it should be ah, there is a minus then uh, uh, c square epsilon naught, right? That is mu, but okay. Because you have a c square, you bring it on the other side. Um, OK, so now, so these are the Maxwell equations. In the Lorentz gauge. But now you see we are in business because uh, we, well, first of all, they are the same equation. So if we solve one, we have solved all four of them. Second, each of them is independent. You can solve it for phi. You can solve it for the x component of A, the y component of A, right? A and they do not couple. So th there is a, a slightly higher hope that you'll be able to solve it. Maybe here is a good point to stop for a second, to pause. And uh, how about these this potentials? I mean, uh, we, we brought them in. Just uh, it looks like a, a mathematical trick, right? I mean, it's just because the divergence of, of a curl of a vector always vanishes that we introduce the, the vector potential and similarly the, the, the scalar potential. But are they real? I mean. Uh, are, are they, I mean, are they physical quantities, meaning that we can measure them, or they are just some artifacts uh, that that is useful for us to uh, to to work with? But uh, okay, up to in classical physics, I would say they are completely an artifact uh, because. Uh, I mean, there is no way to measure directly a potential. Furthermore, you understand that because you have this gauge invariance, I mean, which potentials you are going to measure? Because you can always rescale potential. If you have gauge invariance, you know, the gauge means uh, that you, are, you have a gauge measuring some height, for instance, and you can always change this gauge. So there is no way that this, at the classical level, gives you a, a physical quantity, right? Because physical quantities, the world does not know about this gauge transformation. This is the thing I introduced here, but uh, I mean, the real world does not know about this gauge invariant, this gauge uh, transformation. So all physical quantities must be gauge invariant, right? Otherwise, Lorentz starts with uh, his gauge. Uh, you start with your gauge. You measure two things, and you get two different results. That's clearly not the way the world works. So at the classical level, really, the Physical quantities are the fields, the field strengths, E and B, or H, D, or whatever you have uh, 
if you are not in the vacuum but uh, in some macroscopic medium. And so uh, this is more that uh, it's like a trick. I mean, you use these auxiliary functions. At the end of the day, you use these equations that are all there that give you, for a given scalar and vector potential, give you the electric MD field, and then you, you measure the force, and that's what you, you have. However, at the quantum level, there is something more because of this uh, uh, fact that uh, the phase of, uh, of, of the wave function sort of fills the space uh, more than a classical trajectory, right? Because if you think uh, at the, okay, I know uh, every time in quantum mechanics uh, you start with this uh, sort of, have you seen this uh, sort of, uh, that you have a source of electron, for instance, right? They go through two slits. You must have seen that because it's compulsory. <laughs> Uh, 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 and then uh, uh, you have a screen, right? And, and, and then you have this nice uh, interference pattern, right? So they go through, I don't know, let's call it, I call it this path one and this path two, right? Uh, and this is the basic of quantum mechanics, they tell you. Uh, because, uh, you know, this is a particle, but when you measure the number of uh, hits here, it looks like a, a wave, no? That is interfering. Okay, big mystery. But, uh, uh, okay, I don't want to talk about this, but I just uh, 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 want to, uh, if you have a magnetic field here, for, a, for instance, put a, a solenoid in between these two paths. Have you seen that uh, in, in quantum mechanics or not? Uh, yes, no? No. So if you put a solenoid, let's, let's, so this is a, a cross cut. Then I, I, I look at the same experiment I have here some electron coming, and, and I put here a solenoid, an infinitely long solenoid. So what is the characteristic of an infinitely long solenoid? That inside, we, we have saw you have this constant B field, right? But outside the B field is zero. However, if you compute the, the, compute the vector potential of this field, uh, the vector potential is not zero outside. The vector potential is everywhere in order to produce this B field inside if you solve the problem. So the electron here, in a way, uh, it, it cannot feel the B field because the B field is there and the electron is there. So because we think physics is local, the electron, the guy that goes here or there, does not feel the B field. But however, it, it does feel the, the vector potential, okay? And what happened to this vector potential? Well, uh, if you measure the phase shift, right, this is the question, what is the phase shift of the wave function of the electron, uh, the one that goes through path one with respect to the one that goes through path two, right? And I think this phase shift is, well, is whatever the phase shift is uh, if you, when the B field is not there, right? And I think this is, 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 this, this is what you have computed uh, so, uh, I mean, I if you call x the distance from an arbitrary point here, this phase shift is something like uh, x, uh, uh, the length, uh, say, d over l, and uh, uh, 1 over the Compton, the, the wa Compton wavelengths, right, of the particle. This is the, the, the interference that you produce uh, because of the phase shift uh, in going from one path to the other. If you have ze zero phase shift, you don't have any interference, so you have a constant probability of finding the electron there and there. But okay, I don't care about this because uh, that's, but you also have, uh, you see the wave function, if you go this way, gets a phase, uh, so a, a wave function for the electron in the magnetic field is given by a phase shift that is proportional to the charge of your electron divide by, uh, multiply by the, 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 this integral here, the trajectory, right? So you see that the, if you compute the total phase shift in going from one to two, this must be the sum of the two integral, right? The integral to go through the path one, so one, this vector field, Minus, because now you go back, actually it goes the other way, but I want to close this, minus Q H bar A D L, 
along the path too. But what is this term? This is the, right, this is the, because this goes this way. This is the circuitation of A going around. And what is the circuitation of A going around? Is the, is the flux of B, right? So this is Q over H. If I call S this, is the flux of B across that. So this is different from zero. And you see that uh, because this is different from zero, even though the electron never goes there, but simply because it picks up this phase, phase shift because of the presence of the potential, the vector potential, you get an extra phase shift. So you will see some disturbance in this uh, interference pattern when you turn on the B field here. So that tells you that in these situations, the, you, you see, you are measuring the vector potential in a way because here you only have the vector potential, not the B field. I mean, it's true that uh, that is proportional to the flux of the B field, but locally there you only have the vector potential. So this effect uh, has been measured. It's an experimental fact. Uh, it goes Aronoff, bohm aronov effect, and uh, is the fact that at the quantum level, the vector, the potentials uh, 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 of the electric and magnetic fields, uh, they have sort of a physical reality because their presence shifts the interference pattern that you measure uh, in these typical slit experiments, the two slit experiments. Okay, so this was an aside because we, we do not do quantum mechanics, but uh, it's good uh, to know. So interactions that are invariant and gauge transformations like uh, Maxwell equations, uh, like the, e, uh, the, the, the electromagnetic intensities, are called gauge interactions, okay? And as you probably know, uh, most of the interactions we know, how many interactions do, do we know? I mean, how many fundamental interactions uh, do we know? Uh, you know, the electromagnetic, gravitation, right? that we study together, and then two that we not, did not study together, that the weak and the strong, right? And all, all these four, okay, let's, let's, let's not talk about gravity that is complicated, but the other three are gauge interaction. They are interactions that are invariant under gauge transformation, okay? So you see, it's very important. I mean, this is, from a curiosity, from a trick that Lawrence pulled out from his head, in order to decouple Maxwell equations for the potential became uh, the basis of our understanding of all the interactions. So you see, he, he was just solving a homework in a way and then he discovered without knowing because he died before this became clear, but yes. Gauge. A gauge, you know, it's like uh, in English is uh, if you have a, a something that measures heights or levels, that is a gauge. And as I said, this is, is like here because you fix the level at which you start measuring your A and phi field. So that in that sense, it doesn't matter where you start, so you talk about gauge invariance. So a gauge, if you go in the, in the, in the broiler room where there are all these things that tell you how, uh, how much heat is there, that is a gauge, right? Yes. Well, uh, as I said, then you all the, the they are physical, but all the interactions are gauge invariant. So. No, but uh, you see, in fact, it does not depend directly on the A field. It only depends on, the, on this uh, circuitation of the A field. And the circuitation, you see, happens to be the B field. So you see, at the end of the day, it does not depend. Th this quantity is still gauge invariant. 
So yeah, I'm stressing a little bit uh, the meaning of uh, physical reality because at the end of the day is the B field. But the important point here is not, uh, uh, okay, if you don't have any B field, then uh, th there is no effect. Because you can think of gauge configuration corresponding to zero E and B field, right? So if that is the case, you don't have any physical effect. But the point here I wanted to stress is that locally in the point where the electron goes, you don't have a B field there. You just have the potential. But it's true, as you uh, said, that uh, at the end of the day, if the gauge configuration is a pure gauge, they are called. So gauges in which the E and the B fields vanish, then you don't have an effect. But you need the gauge potential uh, I mean, so you need this potential to explain locally. Otherwise, you have to assume that there is some sort of instantaneous at the distance interaction between the B field and the electron that is there. That's a possibility. But, you know, the general philosophy of field theory is that everything is local. You don't have this sort of, I mean, that's how people explain this, or, you know, that you have this that there is some leakage of the B field that the, the wave function is feeling, and that's what is, uh, but this doesn't seem to be the correct explanation. Okay, but. <coughs> okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's see how far we, uh, so now we have to solve these equations, right? I mean, there is no shortcut here. Uh, we have to, you know, okay, pull up your, our sleeves. And, but okay, uh, you can pick the one you prefer, right? Uh, it doesn't matter. In fact, let me call psi either phi or any components of the vector potential because you see they are the same equation. So if I solve that, I've solved all of them. So let me solve in general this equation here, I, let me call psi. Now this psi is not uh, the gauge function, it's just uh, any scalar function. Uh, psi uh, minus uh, one over c square, the, the <coughs> okay. And this is equal to the source here. Now because there are many four pi's going around, let me call the source any function of r and t. Okay, so this is the source. Let me pull a uh, four pi because uh, I, I always get four pi's and that's actually the reason why the Gauss system is, uh, is nicer than the, than the international system, but uh, okay, it doesn't matter. Let me put a uh, four pi. So this is the source and uh, uh, this is known, okay? I know the source. I know there are charges somewhere, some currents. They are varying in time. Or, or, or not, I don't care. I take the most general. So the system of charges and currents is given. What are the electric and magnetic fields generated by this uh, generic distribution of charges? No, this is the question that Maxwell equations uh, answer. If you have solved that, then you go back to the first class that we had together. You know E and B and you plug into the Lorentz force and you find how these charges move under the influence of these fields, okay? This is the general idea. There is nothing more, but also nothing less. So for the moment, we, we, we in fact, uh, the, the Lorentz part, uh, we already sort of discussed it, even if uh, very briefly, uh, we, we won't come back to that, but now we want to, given a generic distribution of charges and currents varying in space and time, what are the generated uh, electric and magnetic fields, okay? The components of which are represented by this psi function here. Okay, that's a standard problem in mathematics because, you see, if I take this equal to zero, this is exactly the problem that we already solved in uh, electrostatics, right? Because this is the Poisson equation with this normalization and uh, without this T. So we just generalized this discussion of uh, the Poisson that remember in general was solved by the green function. So I want to dis define the green function for this problem. But first 
I want to do a, a, a Fourier transform. I don't like this, this fact that it depends on R and T. I, I rather use Fourier transform to transform this equation to a nicer form. And how you do, you do that? Well, you know, already know that uh, if you have a function of space and time, this can be Fourier transform. This is just a normalization into a function psi of, well, space, I leave it alone. I could Fourier transform everything, but I do not. I Fourier transform just time. So now this, it depends on the frequencies. And this is an integral over the free. Right? This is the Fourier transform. You, you are familiar, right? Huh? You, you don't, what? What, 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 what? If this is the Fourier transform, I can also Fourier transform my source, right? What? You want a square root there? <laughs> You're not going to have it. It's a constant. I mean, it depends on the normalization, right? So. I'm lazy, I don't want to put the square root. It, it, it's still good. Do you remember why the Fourier transforms are useful? Yeah, why do we go through the trouble of introducing a Fourier transform? They must be useful because otherwise, you know, in physics, you, you rarely do something that is not useful. And physicists are very lazy. <laughs> so, it must do something to a differential equation. I told you during uh, several times last year. No. You start, uh, let, uh, you have a differential equation, right? And we don't like differential equation, remember? <laughs> because they are difficult to solve. What do, yeah. One thing we know how to solve are algebraical equations. So the Fourier transform transform a differential equation into an algebraical equation, right? That we know how to solve. Then, of course, you have to Fourier back. And that's where that's complicated. Because there is a conservation of complications. <laughs> Otherwise, everything would be very easy. So you shift the tricky part from solving the equation to Fourier transform back. That's what you are going to do here as well. But this, you see, is not the full Fourier transform. The full Fourier transform will be to Fourier transform also in space. But we are not ready for that because we need special relativity to that. Because, you see, we, st we are not very, well, in principle I could, but then we would have the problem to understand the space-time in which we are Fourier transforming, and we, we do that at the end of this course. So let me just do it uh, the, the old way that I just Fourier transform in time where I know what I'm doing and, and, and I don't have to worry about the relationship between space and time because as we will discover, that is not trivial. It's not simply that space behaves like time. There is a problem with the signs, right? But that's not, it should not be a surprise because we know that space is different than time. No? For once, uh, you, you can move back in space, but it's much harder to move back in time, right? So they must have something that is not exactly the same. So space-time, it, it, it is more or less the same, but the signs <laughs> are different. However, if I Fourier transform in, uh, in, uh, in time, that, tr that equation clearly becomes that where I, where I have this term, I just get, uh, uh, if I call k the ratio uh, between the uh, omega and c, right? I get just a k square here, clearly, because uh, I go to the Fourier space, right? Then I take uh, twice the time derivative. You see, this is uh, become algebraical. Unfortunately, this part does not, because I have not Fourier transform in space. So I hope we will have time to do that uh, in special relativity, where we fully Fourier transform, and then this equation becomes simply an algebraical one. But uh, I think we won't have time. But just bear that in mind. 
So now this is an equation on this Fourier transform. Uh, so maybe I should put the hat, I don't know. Maybe let's see. Well, it's clear that uh, it's the Fourier transform because instead of having time here, you have this. And this is minus 4 pi, the Fourier transform of the source distributions, okay? Now, this is a simpler equation than this one. And it is, is simple enough to, to deserve a name. These are called elliptic uh, partial differential equations. And, and you know, you have a, a mathematical department just studying this kind of equations. Again, if I take k equal to 0, now k equal to 0 in the Fourier space, what does it mean? It does not depend on time, right? If, if it has a difficult wave, wavelengths, not right? Because uh, if k is equal to 0, that means it, the Fourier space is time independent. Therefore, this is there, and you are back to Poisson equation. So, so far, so good. Okay, so I want to study the elliptic partial differential equation defined here, and the way to do this is to introduce the green function. Oh, we have time. So again, you remember the green function that I call, you see, is the J of K, because there is a green function for each value of K, right? Is that function that uh, uh, for given, for, for given, for two given positions in space, right, gives you the delta function. That we, it's exactly like uh, for the Poisson equations, right? So that sort of justify why we spend some time with the Poisson equation. Because uh, it's very similar, but uh, of course there is this uh, this point here that makes the crucial, uh, and we can, uh, like uh, for the Poisson equation, let's call big R the actual distance uh, between these two points. So you see that, uh, uh, I mean, because of the, of the, of the, of the symmetries, and uh, because there are no boundary terms here in this problem, I'm solving it without, uh, this, this Laplacian can only depend on big R, right? It's not going to depend on... Uh, so I can write this operator uh, like 1 over R, the total derivative with respect to big R, right? Of R, G, A, R, G, G, K, okay? I'm, I'm just write, writing the Laplacian in spherical coordinates the one I, I give, gave you the, 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 the photocopies, and, uh, mm, and uh, plus k square is j of k. <coughs> so th this is a still a function of, uh, and this must be minus 4 pi delta r, okay? You remember, what is the, the phi in spherical coordinate? coordinates? Is this something 1 over uh, r, uh, d, d r square r phi, plus the, the 1 over r square? This you should know by heart, even though I don't. I have too many phi, but you understand, this is a big phi. And because uh, it only it, it can only depend on this, it cannot depend on the angular part, so I only pick this part here, and this is what I want here, okay? <coughs> so uh, this is the equation uh, the, the, that we want to solve. Oh, uh, OK. 
okay? So you see that everywhere except uh, at the origin, well, it's not the origin, it's the, when r is identical to r prime, this, uh, this green function must satisfy the homogeneous equation, right? Because the delta function is just zero except when, uh, when, uh, when big R is identically zero, okay? So th this equation, uh, 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 you know, is, is rather simple, right? The homogeneous one, because it's just that uh, R G K, right, of R, well, you record, what is this equation? This When, when big R is equal to zero. When, when, when this is equal to zero, this is different from zero. So when, uh, when, when, uh, so if, if it's different from, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, what, what did I say? I mean, you want this to be equal to zero. So this is equal to zero except, when, okay? So everywhere else, it's the homogeneous equation, okay? Except in R equal to zero, sorry. And what is this equation? This, you see, this is again, uh, you know how to solve. This is, is some combination of exponential, right? Some combination of exponential. Here I forgot this. Ah, uh, no, no, sorry, uh, it's here, right. So you bring this in here, then you see that this is exactly a combination of exponentials. So that means that this, this combination, R, G, K, R, should be some A, E to the I, K, R, plus B, E to the minus K, R, right? Now my R looks like a K, but... And uh, you see, when, when R goes to zero, okay, for simple, just looks at the homogeneous one. For, for R going to zero, right, that means th these are very small coefficients, right? The, well, this, so they, they go to, so K, this goes to zero. So this, uh, you see, so you only want the solution that goes like one over R, okay? Therefore, you have A plus B equal to 1, and the generic solution of this, uh, you can write it here. Well, you, you, you can have two, right? You can have the one with the plus sign here and the one with the minus sign. So these usually are indicated plus minus, okay, K, R, equal E plus minus uh, I, K, K, R over R. These are what, they are, you see, they are spherical waves. These are solution. They look like exponential, but, uh, you know, they're exponential like with the, with, the, with the radii. So they are spherical waves. A one with the plus sign is a expanding spherical wave. Then it's suppressed by this, right? And the other one is an incoming, uh, a collapsing spherical wave, okay? that this is a solution to this? Yeah. Well, you see, the R is here, so you, you bring it back here. And then you have two combinations, the, the one outgoing and the one ingoing. Are two sets of solutions, right? Uh, it's like a, if, if in, you have a solution going one way and a solution going the other way. The only thing is that here is spherical. So the general solution is going to be a superposition of this, but uh, but uh, uh, what about, so I still have to Fourier transform, right? So if I put, uh, now I put uh, the, the solutions into the Fourier transform. So it's one over two pi 
uh, the integral minus infinity plus infinity e to the either plus or minus uh, kr over r e to the minus omega t but you see t minus t prime because it's the green function d omega so this is the green function plus or minus sometimes these are called the advanced and the, the retarded you'll see why in a second uh, that is a function of r and now t minus t prime so this would be the solution of the I mean, sorry, this would be the green function for this, uh, for this problem. Well, actually, we have two green functions, two possibilities of green function. And, uh, as I said, uh, uh, the, the complication is that you have to do this integral. But actually, it's not that much of a complication, right? Because if you remember the definition of a delta function, you see this is essentially, you see this does not depend on the, on the, on the omega. So you have an integral of the exponential minus i to the something. That's the definition of, with even the 2 pi of the delta function. So this, this integral, this integral is just, uh, well, this is, this is 2 pi, uh, 2 pi divided by, by r, big R. Big R is just there. And all this stuff here, you see, is the, you see, it's, it's like the, the, the delta function of t minus t prime minus or plus, depending, of, of, of uh, r divided by c, if you put back. You see, because k is omega divided by c, so you pull in inside, you get the switch of this sign, and then you have this. So when you plug in here, you have this 2 pi that goes away. That's if you had the square root. You had to normalize also there. And so you get the delta function uh, of, uh, um, uh, well, let's write it like this. It's t prime. I, I switch it around. So it's t prime minus t minus plus r minus r prime divided by c. So I, I, I rewrite r as a, as the length of the difference in these two vectors and divided by a big R that again is R minus R prime. Okay? No? What what is what is missing? So you take this, now I Fourier transform. So I take this and I put in here. I, now I'm Fourier transforming. So where, 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 where did you get lost? This? No, I mean, put k equal to omega c, right? So you see omega multiplies this, this stuff here, multiplies t minus t prime, right? Then minus, because I pull a minus here, so minus plus r divided by c. So this is the exp this exponential becomes this, right? So then I know that the integral mi minus infinity to plus infinity of e to the i x dx is equal to 2 pi delta x, right? So and then I just plug back uh, the definition. R, big R, was the, 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 the distance between R and R prime. And so I have this. So now I have my my uh, solutions. I have uh, uh, let's see, rewrite it here. Well, I, I have the green function. Then the solution follows from from the green function. So I have my green function that I write here. So uh, it's delta t prime minus. Now, what was the green function of the Poisson equation? It was just one over, right? If you f forget, forget about the boundary condition, it was just one over r minus r prime. So you see, 
It's just the difference, it, you get this extra delta function. This is really beautiful, right? Because it, it's like the previous problem, right? The only difference is that you have to compute your green function not at the time t, but at this time t prime. And do you see why that? You see, these are called the retarded and the advanced, depending on which sign you pick. Pick the retarded one, right? Okay? It's t minus this. This is the time it takes to light to get to the point there. Because you see, say you have some charge moving, and you are looking here, this is R, and that the other is R prime. And you are sitting here, and this charge suddenly decides to go left. Okay? So you are sitting here, you are not going to find out about this instantaneously. Not at the time t. At the time t, this goes left, and you are here. But it takes a time t plus or minus, depending, say, the distance. You see, this r minus r prime divided by t is the time it takes light from here to reach you. So until that information reaches you, you don't know about the fact that the charge has gone left. So that's why it's called retarded. So your green function is exactly like the green function for the static problem. But uh, what you see is the position of the charge at the retarded time. Because you only know about the charge after light has reached you. You see how beautiful it is? So it's built in the theory that uh, there is no instantaneous uh, propagation of signals. And therefore, your green function can only depend on the retarded time. So you see here the field as it was produced by the charge at the time t minus r minus r prime divided c, that is the delta t that it takes light to bring you the information. The, the odd thing is that uh, it could also work the other way because you see Maxwell equations are completely time reversal invariant. I mean, I can switch t to minus t, and the equations are exactly the same. So it's also true that it would work also that at the advanced position. So that's a little odd. And for this reason, we use the retarded solution. But in principle, everything is fine, because it's time invariant. So in a way, you could build up your green function from the advanced positions instead of the retarded one. In general, we use the retarded one because for the way our, brain, our brains work, that, uh, makes, make, that makes more sense. But uh, from the point of view of, of the equations, uh, uh, this was also true, by the way, uh, for Lagrangian equations and everything. It was completely invariant. You could switch t to minus t, and that would be still a solution, right? From the point of view of classical mechanics, the, 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 the proverbial cap dropping down and breaking uh, and then gen you know uh, uh, reforming exactly the same way and popping up there are two exact perfectly fine solutions of the same equation it just then happens that usually things fall down and doesn't don't. but to understand that you need some uh, some thermodynamics and so this is the green function uh, and you know that if you have the green function right now you can write the, the, the gen general solution. So now I can write psi, right? Psi r of t, that is the solution of this. Uh, uh, I think this equation has a name. Is that the Kirchhoff equation? Well, OK. Well, look it up. But uh, anyway, uh, I mean, uh, the general solution of that uh, is going to be uh, any solution of the homogeneous equation right, any solution of the homogeneous equation plus the, the so that's, uh, uh, so I call it psi in. I call it psi in because I'm assuming that is a, 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 a some incoming solution. But again, because of this time invariance, it would be okay also to put a, a outcoming solution plus the integral over space and time of your green function, okay, so I take in, so I take the retarded green function of R and T, 
uh, uh, and uh, R prime and T prime of my source, right? You, you have to So this is the t minus infinity situation because it's the incoming. Okay. And actually, because you see that the t part is just a delta function, so there is an easier way to write this solution. Okay, this is whatever it is. Let's take the, the equal to zero. I mean, it's, it's not going to be. And so everything, I can do the t part of this integral because it's just a delta function. So this solution is just exactly the same as in the, in the Poisson equation case, right? But the only thing is that uh, here I should put... Uh, some uh, to remember to to remind me that this t prime is at the retarded time, meaning that t prime is not the t at which I'm, but is t minus r minus r prime divided by c. Okay, so everything looks like the static case, except that I have to remember that the static case is not the one at the time I'm doing it, but is at the previous time, the retarded time. Because that hits me only when light reaches the position in which I am. Is this completely clear? Or otherwise I repeat it because it's, it's the most important point. It's the take home. It's very nice. I mean, it's exactly. So it's not, I mean, you may have thought that it was a complete waste of time to solve the Poisson equation. But actually now you discover that uh, uh, it was not, because essentially it's like before. Uh, you only have to remember that the time is the retarded time. And you have solved the full equation, not just the Poisson. <coughs> yes? This? Why I put, I put it to zero? Well, because, it, I mean, you see, I, I can do whatever I want here because it's a blackboard. <laughs> well, that is the, is the solution of the homogeneous equation. So it's something that is there before you put your charges. So it's coming from uh, somewhere, from infinity, in fact. Uh, are they, uh, you know, when you start counting, t equal minus infinity. Then uh, you have these charges coming in, and they generate this. So I may as well put it to zero because it's not going to. But maybe you have a, a plane wave there before you start putting charges. So that is still there. You know, yeah. While you were plane, a, a plane wave comes and pa pass through. But it, it, you just add it and if nothing is changing. So if, I, if this plane tends to zero, when you see your The green function. The, the delta, delta function. Ah, the retarded. Uh, yeah, because there was an e to the uh, plus or minus. So one is an expanding wave and one is an incoming wave. And uh, because our experience is that we have causality, meaning that uh, you explain the present status using the previous one, we take the retarded. But uh, from the point of view of the equations, you may explain the present status with the future as well. I mean, it, 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 it's the same from the point of view of the equations. Our experience is that it's the past that uh, uh, modifies the, the, I mean, the, the term in the present. But uh, in fact, you could even take a, a linear superposition of this. I could take, for instance, that half comes from the past and half comes from the future. It has been done. I mean, you, it doesn't matter. It even has some advantages in, in field theory. But, uh, I mean, uh, for us, uh, let's stick to the, 
to, to the one that has an intuitive uh, explanation. So, uh, well, now I can write uh, the solutions for, so you see, uh, we have solved the Maxwell equation, so no big deal, actually. And uh, by using this, uh, this, this, uh, this uh, I have that uh, the vector potential, therefore, at the point R, so the vector potential at the space point, I start talking about space-time because very soon we will talk about that. So uh, at the space-time point identified by R and T is given by, uh, so now is A, so I have mu not uh, divided by 4 pi, if I did it right, this integral D3R uh, over the volume where you have some current, so prime, J in this volume, T prime, but retarded, right, divided by R minus R prime. So now I'm specifying the source, okay? So you have three components, you rebuild the, the vector potential. Then you take the curl and you have your B field. Similarly, phi at space point uh, uh, R uh, uh, T is 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught, the same thing, right? Only now you have the charge density R uh, prime T prime, again, retarded R minus R prime. If you go back, this, was, this is exactly the same solution of the static problem, and the only difference is that uh, a minus sign. Okay, I trust you. So in general, if you, so I stop here, but uh, uh, let me, so if you are sitting here, right, x, y, z, this is the, 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 Okay, the point R, so here you have a, a P, you have the present position, say, of a charge, okay? So now it's, it's time T, present position of a charge here, and this is R, and you are here. So what do you do? You, you compute this, right? But the point is that you compute this by taking J and rho from this charge, not at the present point, but at a previous point, P prime, right? That is the retarded position where the distance between these two is T prime equal to T minus uh, this R prime divided by C. So this is the retarded uh, So yours here. The, the, the charge is here, but you compute as if it had been there. Because, you know, whatever it's doing, it takes time to reach you. So what it's doing here, it will reach you, you know, at a, a later time, when, when, it, uh, when actually the charge will be here. From the sun, yeah. eight seconds, yeah. Right, that's exactly the same. As they say, if the sun explodes now, you still, no, eight minutes. Eight minutes. You still, ha I, s I can go on for st eight more minutes before we are yeah. burned away. <laughs> okay. It's exactly the same. Actually, well, there is even, yeah, light is eight minutes. So that, but you see here, it, it's already here is built in the, 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 the meaning of the, of the Einstein relativity because, because light has a finite speed, you see you have all these effects due to the retardation. And the only further input is, is this speed the same for all frames of references? Because we learn from classical mechanics that physics is the same if you are uh, at rest or you are moving with constant speed. But here you see it, it, it seems that something may be wrong because 
what is the speed of this? Uh, I, I wrote C, 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 C everywhere. But what now if we are, are moving with a, a, a speed V? Should I replace C plus V everywhere or not? Right, so we will have, you see, we are forced to address this problem. Okay, so I'll I, uh, I stop here and, and then we, we proceed with, the, with some more. Uh, now we have the general solution so we can apply to a single child, to some child distribution oscillating in time, that is an antenna, that is what produces uh, radio waves, uh, and then, uh, and then uh, some more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.